Here we go, we are live. So, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Godox Facebook Live Talk. And today we have the great honor to talk, to interview with Luke Edmondson and with David. Um, hi, guys. Hey. So today we are going to talk about fine art, uh, you know, portrait, which is, um, I think, Luke has this unique style, right? Which everybody knows. And um, so I'll leave everything to Luke and you can talk about that yourself. <laughs> I'll leave everything to you, shall we? Sure. And we have a very long lecture slides to run through and lots of contents, including uh, BTS, as well as some, uh, you know, retouching because the contents are so full and we try to fit everything in one hour and a half. We actually have to do a speed edit. So enjoy, guys. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having us again. Uh, I would encourage anybody uh, who's watching this to go back and watch uh, our first talk that we did, which was on uh, kind of the more of the theoretical side of, of making a complete picture. What is it that we're looking to put in the content of our picture? And then the second talk that we did was on LED lighting. And, uh, and from this one, what we're looking at is, is kind of trying to uh, bring things down to a very basic level uh, for people, especially those that might be interested in fine art photography. Uh, or fine art portraiture. And uh, of course, the, the first question that we kind of all ask, you know, uh, is kind of popular, but, but basically we, we say, well, we'll know it when we see it. We know when we see art, uh, but, but what can we actually say to quantify uh, what is fine art photography? And so it's, it, to us, I think to many people, it's any type of work that conveys an idea, a message, uh, has emotion to it, it's conveying an emotion to it. There's a depth to the work uh, that we're looking at. It goes beyond uh, what we would say is just a literal representation. And more than just storytelling. Yeah, it's more than just storytelling, right? We can storytell sometimes in a very simple manner. We talked about that in the LED lighting of just trying to add depth, uh, perhaps to uh, our backgrounds or something to try and add a little story, but that's not necessarily something that's gonna be fine art portraiture or fine art photography. Um, once we get beyond the literal representation, then the next thing that we have to ask ourselves is, uh, you know, what is it that we're, we're trying to do? Well, our subject or our scene needs to convey that message that we talked about, and that can be done in either a simple or a complex way. So what do I mean by that? You could take a very broad topic, um, you know, whatever might be popular or du jour of the day or something that's personal to you. Uh, let's just talk about uh, a simple concept like birth, right? So you could talk about birth as, as a whole pregnancy journey, or you could talk about birth as uh, the actual, the more specific act uh, that's occurring there. You could talk about the joy of life, but you can also distill it down to a very particular moment. And uh, I know with you in the car today, I was talking to you about oh, even the idea of, of baking cookies was something I was thinking about yesterday. And when I thought about what's truly universal about baking cookies, sure, you see lots of pictures that might be somebody with a glass of milk and it says what they're doing. Or flour on the nose. Or flour on the <laughs> nose, right? They're these kind of things. But, you know, if you could illustrate to people that feeling, and, and Aries, tell me if this is true for you, but, you know, when you bake cookies, there's something about uh, eating the warm cookie. Like right when it's come out mm. of the oven, it's still got a little softness to it, right? And there's just kind of a certain... Mm feeling that yeah. comes along with that and you, and you have this feeling like hey this is before it's all supposed to actually be served but yeah I, I get to have i get to have one in advance that's right that's right and so that might be distilling something down to a particular moment in the bigger arc and so that's what we're we're trying to say to you that you're looking to do you want to have when you do fine art you want to have something that is personal about it it reflects the explorations of an artist sure and their kind of their statement and their vision what they're trying to say to their audience. Yeah. So what do we mean even by that? Well, it's the author's reality transformed, right? That's a good an acronym perhaps for, for art. It's the author's reality is transformed. And so one of the things that you want to do is you want to have a vision when you go into it, which is why we talk so much about in the making a complete picture, like how do you go about thinking through your photographs uh, to begin with? And then finally, you know, as you're getting into different things, it needs to have intention needs to engage our audience uh, when they look at it. It needs to um, have a refineness to the technique. 
because when we look at the when we look at something we consider art, it's probably not something that looks either artificial or something that looks like it's a mere hack and chance, like a, a snapshot or a documentary uh, style like that. One of the things about technique is that we say it shouldn't overpower the vision of the artist unless, you know, the caveat to anything is there's always a, an exception. And the exception would be if the technique itself is supposed to draw attention to itself, much like Jackson Pollock did with the way that he did his, his, his drops on his canvas, right? The technique there became very much to the forefront of what he was trying to communicate in terms of the pain itself. Yeah, I think technique in general should be secondary to whatever you're trying to convey. It should just almost grow on you. Um, after you see several pieces from the art, you go, I really like the, the kind of the style that they're presenting in the technique. Well, so, so that brings us to an interesting thing. Fine art, to some degree, there should be a unified feeling to the body of work. From the artist or from a series uh, uh, of pieces that they've that they've created so what we thought we'd start by doing with you guys is basically saying aries here's kind of three questions if you can be the audience and or if you can also tell us things that people in the audience uh, are asking in terms of questions and so we're asking ourselves why when we look at it we're asking what was the intent what's the message so the why the intent and the message and so what we wanted to show you guys it starts with a portrait. first is starting with a portrait. This is not fine art, okay? This is a, a young girl who we started shooting when she was how old? Two years old, right? And, uh, and we were very fortunate in that she was uh, going to come in and spend some time with us. You heard with me this summer. Yep. And so as part of that, we said, uh, we will go out and do a shoot with you at least once or twice a week to be able to create some things. And this year she's a high school senior, so we were trying to do different, more fine art type things for her high school senior shoot that would be different than just high school senior portraits. That's exactly right. So our first shot that we started with essentially has kind of a a, a sense of, she's in an, in an old 1850s farmhouse, she's by a candle, we wanted to light it with a lot of mood to it, so it has kind of a blue type feeling. Uh, well, her favorite movie is for the women. Uh -huh. um, and so this is about her and her creative process because she is an artist. And But she, in Little Women, they would always put on a special coat, even in over their pajamas when they were starting their creative adventure. So pulling on that thread, taking the idea of Little Women, in creating this type of coat and the fact that oftentimes the, the artistry was early in the morning was the time that she would get up to be able to, to do some work and work by candlelight. And so therefore, you wind up with a picture that looks something like this. And so you can kind of see all those different elements coming together within uh, this particular piece. But she's there, she has her books, she has her art. If you could uh, zoom in closer, you'd be able to see that she has her drawing pen and, uh, and so she's beginning her work there. And we had only rented this facility for two hours. So we ended up with two different shots because basically by the time we set up the shot, we broke down it was probably an hour at each place. Yep. So what was the key thing? Well, we spent more time on this one than on any of them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what was the key thing that we were looking for in terms of our equipment? We wanted to be lightweight. We wanted to be portable. The people say, well, how did you light it? What did you use, right? And so for this one, we ended up using the, the LC500. And various reasons, number one, the barn doors became uh, particularly beneficial for us. Uh, it chiseled the light on her face. Yeah. It also produced a soft quality of light. It was a continuous light uh, that we could use. And then we also uh, wanted to be able to have the ability to change our color temperature. So those are all the things that informed our decision to use the tool that we use. So this gives you an idea of what the picture looked like uh, coming straight out of camera and you can see that we have our stands there I shot some behind the scenes uh, pictures just with my iPhone uh, here's the vantage point that you would see from camera as dad's looking through there and you can see that we have our barn door coming in over the top on a boom this brings you into the scene a bit more and what you should see here is that we have essentially three lights that are shown in this picture one coming in on top, that's our hair light. One that's coming in from the, the right-hand side door, and that we use as a separation light. 
and then we have one that's tilted that we're using in order to be able to create our form on her face. Yes, we put a little barn door on it so it, that it would kind of feather off where the handle was. Not only feather off, but it wouldn't spill. In other words, because I think sometimes if we thought, if we're really talking to people that are starting out, what do we mean by feather and sure. things like that? We didn't want the light to strike the candle. We wanted it to be flat from that. And, and in doing that, it was overexposing the book, and so it was very important to be able to pull up on that little barn door. Yep. Now, one of the things that you often find when you use directional light and you start chiseling somebody's face is that sometimes your contrast ratios can become a little bit too high. It can become a little too fast to change from light to dark. That's what we mean by when we say our contrast ratios. And so the answer there, as we spin around here, as you can see, since it had a white wall there, all we had to do is take one more light and bounce it into the wall in front of her. And then that acts as our fill light. So four lights to be able to uh, light that shot and, uh, and pull it together. And you can see how each one has a specific purpose in terms of what it does. I love our sirens in our, <laughs> it's very exciting today. <laughs> So this, we take, take you back here, and then this becomes the final version of what we wanted it to look like, to reflect. Yeah. So does that kind of walk you through mm. kind of how the process was done? What would be a question you would have if you were somebody starting out, Aries, about how to pull off I, I would want to, if possible, could, could we just zoom in like 200% so we can, people can see the amazing details of her pen, what she's drawing and all the elements. Sure. And, uh, you know. Uh, that's I think that's it's that's it's that's on top left. I think it's on top left corner of the um, yeah, like yeah, zoom. It would be, but I think I've hidden that screen real quick. So let me just zoom in one more time. Yeah, just yep. zoom like. Yep. You want me to zoom again? Yeah, yeah. I think there's a zoom you can select about two hundred percent or something like that. Yeah, on the top left corner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Yep. Okay. Yeah. 200% you want. Now I'm just uh, in general so people can see. Because it's, um, it's the problem we had with last week. Because uh, it's uh, the broadcasting is about 720p. Yep. Uh, people on the other end, they wouldn't be able to see that as much details as showing in front of so yours here you or my see, screen. It's not yeah. just her in the act of drawing, but she has one of her drawings here on the yep. page. And uh, even, you know, sometimes when people do things with candles, one of the things they oftentimes don't take enough time uh, in terms of making it believable is going ahead and letting some of that wax, that wax start to spill. Like if I want to believe somebody's been spending a period of time, then I need to see the natural elements that are there having done what we would expect them to do. So those are some little clues in terms of doing things. Then you can see the light coming into it. Yep. Yeah, here's a question, Luke, if you don't mind. Sure. What's the question? Uh, it's showing up here. Can you see it? On the, um... Yes. What exposure did you achieve with that setup? Yep. So that in order to let the candlelight come through, generally speaking, whenever we use candlelight, we typically try and shoot it at about a 30th of a second just to let the warmth of the candle come through. So the ambient yep. light. Yep. 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 So I'm going to say to you that we were shooting at about ISO 800 at a 30th of a second and uh, at F5.6, and I'll confirm that for you real quick, so I can do that faster. <laughs> you know what, I bet that's pretty close to being accurate. Yep. After all these years, you can pretty much guess exactly what you would have set your camera to at the time. Yep. Okay, so I lied to you. We were shooting at ISO 800 at a 40th of a second at F5.6. ISO 500, 40th of a second, that's what we did in order to get this stuff. Cool. Yep. That's great. Couple so, of, go ahead. A couple of nice people saying hi. Welcome. <gasps> Hello, Mr. Dionis. Hey, man. It's good to see you, sir. So for the next shot, we then took her and two of the elements that she had given to us that were important to her family were a pipe and then also having a... Uh, a watch, a gold watch that was important to their family. And so the question becomes, what do you do with a pipe and a watch? Yes. And they, had, and she had brought it down from Minnesota. That was important 
family of items that she wanted to collaborate with. Yep. So, you know, the idea of, of a watch to us suggests the idea of time, clearly. The idea of a, uh, a pipe also suggests time. Oftentimes, they lose your time. Uh -huh. But you know, the other way that people can use uh, things like a pipe or tobacco or whatever is it can also be a way that you calm yourself, right? <laughs> uh, sometimes people do that. So, uh, in this particular case, what was your white balance? Yep. So, our white balance for this one was set to, I think we set it to 5,000 what we set our, our life on to, according to our metadata. So for the next shot, we said we want to show her in a sense of frustrated while she's waiting, and that's why she has the, the pipe. So that begins with this shot. So there she is. She's holding onto her watch. She has the pipe in her hand. And we stop shot within the scene. You want to blow it up just a little bit? Yeah. To her hand and yep. So I'll go back to here. Here's what the straight out of camera shot looked like, and we did shoot it um, underexposed. We generally, you'll see that we shoot all of our stuff underexposed, but that would be the straight out of camera shot. I did that specifically knowing uh, because when I'm working on an image, I want to make sure that I have just enough detail in my uh, highlights of my skin tone. Yeah. And, I, and I know why I like that. So here is this shot. We shot it with the AD 300s. I know that a question I saw on a recent one was, you know, which, you know, which modifiers did you use? Did you use the Bowen modifiers? Did you use the official uh, AD 300 ones? And the answer is absolutely use the AD 300 ones because it was so much easier to have something that was convenient, portable, and fit. It's not that we couldn't use Bowen's modifiers. We certainly have lots of likes for that as well. But we were trying to be compact as we moved around. To be able to do things and that was the big thing for us is that it became very portable and so go ahead i was going to have you blow that up just a little bit on the watch i'm going to yep yep here i'll go into it right now so let's go into 200 percent yep okay well who's that handsome man in the back well that's my dad <laughs> but you can see she has the pipe in her hand here she has the watch in her hand yep and then of course got my dad put into this particular shot playing the role of the conductor. Oh, hello, how are you, sir? Good to see you. So we use the, the built-in modifiers. We use this one right here, which is just the, the Octobox, Softbox, whatever you want to technically call it here, the Softbox. And we put two lights going through the windows, and then we put one light inside. One, so One for each trim. One, one for each trim, exactly. So here's what the straight out of camera shot looked like. So you can see that I was envisioning this becoming more of a rectangle, or just not a rectangle, a square. It was shot like this so that we had a little bit more room to the size it needed. And that was our, our exposure. Here's what I always laugh about, because I say to Dad, the most important- Sorry, light, how many lights did we use? Three, just three. So the most important light to me was the light- that Oh, was, three, yeah. Was the light that was inside the room with me with the camera. So, you know, as we look at this here, we know we need to have two lights coming from the side windows to light our subjects. But this light right here is the one that controls how contrasty it is, right, and how directional it is. So this light right here was at half power, and it was just pointed to the ceiling, so it could just bounce around in the room. Obviously, there's ambient light coming in as well. And then these were the lights as they were positioned out by the window. So we used an umbrella on the light that was closer to her, and we used the, uh, the soft box on the light that was hitting my dad. And if I pull up my metadata on that for you guys real quick, this was shot at F8 at an 80th of a second, and uh, shot with a, an ISO 400 with a 24 millimeter lens. And the lights on the outside were set to, she was a little bit, uh, her light was set a little bit brighter. It was set to a quarter power, and the light for my dad was set to an eighth power. And that's what we did in your final shot. Which is pretty amazing with these 300s, that they are powerful enough that they will overpower the daylight through the windows. That's yeah, the fascinating thing is you could have done this with a V1, you could have done this with a 600, you could have done this with a 1200, you could have done it with any of the lights that Godox offered because we were actually cutting back the amount of power that we needed to come through here 
because the main thing that we wanted to do was get our lights up high enough and angled down enough that we could just cast these shadows here and have that light coming across on the floor down here. Like that was the most important part. And then just have enough light coming through here to light him, but we didn't want it to be so bright that it overpowered you and sucked you into this room. We wanted to make sure that we had enough light that was here that, that yet created just a bit of play off the two of them as they were so close in proximity. So that's how that picture came about. Can I give you a little side story? Yes. Uh, part of her internship is we have quite an extensive little prop closet, and she loves to play dress up, but now that she's 18, doesn't feel like she can. And so she's had so much fun this summer uh, just trying on all the <laughs> prop clothes while she's working. <laughs> yeah, for sure. We'll show you some of those pictures too. So with the next picture, what we ended up doing is, is kind of an idea of harvesting and the idea of as you are um, as you are a high school senior and you're at that launching point, getting ready to head off and, and, and go into the world. And so we shot this shot like this. And so we brought in some Sorry, look, can we, um, can I interrupt yeah. really oh. quick? There yes. are two questions. Okay. The question. um, yes. there, there are two questions from the audience. Maybe yep. we can go back to the previous picture and uh, answer those two questions. Yep. Uh, if you could look at the screen. Yep. Yes. Time, do, Jay. do we have problems with noise in the dark? that you understood? Used to, absolutely. So we happened to shoot with the Nikon D850, and we have found that we have a great amount of latitude in terms of our dynamic range with that particular camera, which allows us to do that. Now, if you went too underexposed, it could be a problem, but just going slightly underexposed, uh, this again here, let me go back and fit the slide there, uh, but this is the actual, what we shot in camera. So was this able to be brightened up to that? Absolutely. Yeah. But you, but used to, yes, if you shot either a higher ISO, uh, all of a sudden the noise would just appear in older cameras, but uh, we didn't do any noise reduction on any of these shots. Yep. Okay, and then the next is very nice. Can you please show the straight out of camera image with all the lighting? So that's the straight out of camera image. If that meets that need, um, go ahead. Amazing details. <laughs> and then, and again, we purposely underexposed. Yep, and then this is where the lighting was. So a light placed in the room close to the camera, off to the side, and uh, pointed straight up at the ceiling. So all it's going to do is bounce into the ceiling, bounce around, and just fill the, the ambient there. And all that does is it helps for these lights, which are very directional lights that are being pointed at the subjects. It just makes the, so their shadows essentially in these areas down here don't go quite as dark yeah, right and so if i was to show it to you on the straight out of camera picture that might be the easier the, the, the better one to show to you yep yep there we go that's great thanks rick yep yep here yep. yep. we go yep so that that would be we're trying to control how dark these areas are going here how dark these areas are going here by bouncing that light up into the scene of course, the one thing we can't control, it's actually okay, is because the way that the light would actually come from this window is the ambient light still has some light that's casting the shadow upwards on the clock. But we wanted to have it feel like the light still was coming down on her a bit like this in terms of her shadows. Yeah, a little more direction. Yeah, a little bit more direction on the subjects. We can't. We could have overpowered this so much that this just went dark, but that wouldn't necessarily convey the, the mood to the light that we would have wanted. Okay? So, so we took them out in the fields, and so this becomes a shot that we did with uh, the new uh, AD 1200. So we had 1200 watts of light to be able to work with. We needed two power packs to be able to light them because we needed to space them on two different levels. So we had one light that was going to light here on the front subject and one light back here. Uh, people don't want to know what the exposure was. So we shot this one at ISO 50 uh, at F16 a 500th of a second using high speed sync and uh and it was with a 35 millimeter lens so this being the ad 1200 pro i'm hopeful that y'all have seen or, or heard of it this is what the actual shot looked like out of camera in order to be able to get the shot this become the placement of the lights out in the field so in this case, we don't really want to have any diffusion on the lights. We just want to direct the lights. So that's why we use the, the more scoop type uh, 
attachment. This is showing it from the camera position there as they were there in the field. And then again, that becomes the final shot. So you came in on this one and you had to do some darkening. You had to get rid of a road that was off to the right. Yeah, I haven't uh, even finished the shot, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm just saying, this, it's just good to show people like what you can it's do. in progress. Yeah. But I'm saying like these become the things that you figure out how you're going to do. The funniest thing was her pouring the water into the guy's uh, cup and then we have to keep pouring it back in because there's only so much water. <laughs> And this is shot in Texas, and it was, you know, roughly, you know, what would be 100 degrees in, uh, in Australia or elsewhere in Celsius, 35, 36 degrees, something like that, like just very hot, 40 degrees, like just very, very hot. They, they were melting. Yeah. Uh, so this entire shoot, we had about roughly 10 minutes, I would say, to get them out of the air conditioning, come out mm. and uh, and get the shot. And that's where just, the power comes in handy. Just out of curiosity, Luke, what... Um, What's the artistic reference of this? Is a reference to a certain photographers or certain painters uh, the, yeah. in terms of color, color, color placements as well as the subject sure. placements? Yeah, yeah, we didn't do that. We didn't want to make this too artsy for you. Yeah, it, it, it's basically to Van Gogh, and, and uh, he did many things yeah. on uh, planting seeds, but this is yeah. kind of the harvest. So this is like re reaping the rewards. So it's kind of like she's completed high school. She's built these friendships. Uh, the sower, the classic Van Gogh sower. Absolutely. And the, she mm. picked these people to be in the shop with her. She picked their clothing. She did all the things because we were not only trying to teach her how to do more acting when working on uh, fine art images, but even actually help her to even understand what it takes to art direct. You know, acting is a big key that I think is part of people are going to do more fine art portraiture versus what I'd say uh, portraiture that has an artistic treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, you know, oftentimes with that, it's more about you're taking a, a classic portrait or a traditional portrait or a pleasing portrait. And the motive qualities are probably more um, uh, easy to connect with. Uh, but at the same time, you're then just slapping some form of post production on it to make it look party, right? Yeah. And oftentimes, whenever you're doing stuff that conveys uh, a storytelling type piece or an idea, uh, then their expressions might be more like you can feel what the person was going through, what it's like to carry something, the labor that they're going through. Uh, you know, it's not always just smile, look at the camera. Absolutely. And we had seen so many in high school seniors when they were having their portraits made that would put on a mask uh, to kind of get them ready for. Uh, just, just because this year has been so different that we decided to take it in a different vein and actually go back with more of the French doctors next. Yep, so you're getting ready to talk about the next shot, which I'm all for. I was going to answer Abby's question real quick. What lights were used again, the 1200? Yes, sir. We used the 1200 Pros. So you can see here, here is the power pack, which you may not be able to see right now because it's actually down low. So let me come in a little bit tighter here. See how your iPhone does. <laughs> yep. So there's the power pack down there in the grass. And then we've got our, our, our lights up here. So there they are. 1200 head. And boom, it rocked it out. Were these at full power? Don't you know it. <laughs> we're at full power. <laughs> so we're putting out 2400, uh, 2400 watts of, of light on that scene just to try and get it. And we're already down at our lowest data by ISO because it was shot at about four o'clock in the day. We wanted it to be later, but we just couldn't make it work. And the Did question you use high speed sync? Yes. Oh, 500 yeah. of a second. 500 of a second okay. is, what I, is what we ended up doing it at. Yeah. Let's see here. I think I've gotten that all. We'll get this here. Yep. There we go. What programs okay. do you prefer for editing? That's a great question. So when we show you the editing video, how about we go into the explanation of, of it then? Because I think that's the perfect time to answer okay. that question. And I don't want to delay the question, cool. but I think we can go on a rabbit trail. Um, so you were talking about the French, uh, and, and we were asked to repeat what our what our exposure was on that. So that one was, let me double check here, but it was a 500th of a second. I know that from memory. And uh, yeah, F16 at a 50th, or excuse me, at, at, ISO, at ISO 50, I've said it all wrong here. Aperture was F16 and the shutter speed was 500th of a second is what that took. 
So we talked about the, the French pandemic here. So that's the shot that you had done here, uh, kind of playing off of, of the mask that everybody is getting to wear right now. Even the, even the color grading of the uh, field is a little off on purpose. And this was just, just an off year. And this was shot with just uh, a single uh, AD 1200 out there in the field, correct? Yes. Yep. And if you look here, you know, these are things that if somebody was really starting out and wanting to know kind of how to do some stuff, if I zoom in 200% here, you can see how we're using clamps to be able to make the outfit fit or get tighter or do different things. And so you can always edit your clamps out. A lot of times people think they have to get clothing that works perfectly or that clothing that doesn't have a hole in it or all sorts of different things. But it, you can find imperfect clothing that has the right look that you're going you for. You can never wear an everyday life. You can be perfect. Exactly right. It's perfect for photo shooting. So you use those things like that just to, to make it happen. Yeah. So, so she forgot her blouse this, that morning. So so you ended up with in the blouse. <laughs> and so that becomes, you, you get a scarf and you photograph the scarf and you take all that. And so you come up with something that looks like this. Yeah. Sorry, just out of curiosity, what's the bird um, symbolized of? So, if you, so back in 19, well, this is the 18, 18 yeah, the, during, during, the, during the, the viruses that were going on then, these were the masks that the French doctors would wear. And, oh. And, and that, they were the plague masks. And so that is a historic mask from uh, that time. Well, it's not okay. it's, a it's, replica. A it's, a, it's a replica of the historic mask, yeah. exactly. So it was just, I mean, we've done front porch portraits, we've done all these kinds of different things. It was how do you kind of play off the idea of, for her senior year, uh, graduating from high school, going off to college, you know, how do you reflect just the times of the day? Be a conversation piece for her and her, her future children, should she have any. Yep. Okay. So, go ahead. Can we, can I interrupt really quick? Okay. Here's a question from Abby. Uh, I think he's referring to the previous shots with uh, Vincent van Gogh's um, wheat yep. field. Yep. He said, would um, a 600 work in yep. such shot? Yes. Now the 600 would just have to be closer to your subject or you would have to change what your f-stop is to some degree uh, just to open up a bit because it has less power so it doesn't have to work as hard. But the difference between the 600 and the the 1200, I guess, in theory, is, is a full stop. Uh, yeah, it says, is the, AC, will, will the 8600 support this kind of photo? Absolutely. 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 Mm -hmm. Just like when we did the, the shot inside the train station with the 300, it could have been done with a V1, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it just depends on how close you need to get your lights to your yeah. subject matter. What we would probably have done if it was this type of shot here, and we were shooting it with a 600, we may not have been able to show as much room to the side. We may have had to come uh, in, crop in just a little bit tighter and make them a little bit more larger in the frame if we didn't have enough power to throw and be able to get light on their face. One of the games mm -hmm. that Luke and I play is trying to do so much this on camera so that we don't have to turn out the balls. Yeah, I mean, when possible. You see, this is a popular technique that wedding photographers use all the time, whether it's with a 300 or a 600 or whatever, is they'll bring their assistant in or put the light stand in the shot shoot the shot so they get the proper light on the individuals and and then they just simply remove those stands and then shoot the reference shot it helps to use a tripod uh, but you don't have to and then now you can just quickly erase out your lights if you need to but with the 1200 yeah. you have so much power you didn't have you don't have to uh do oh, that anymore. Issues <laughs> when you're doing that yeah. <laughs> but like to me i figure i was thinking in, in in abby's shoes right i'm thinking if i use 8600 uh and retouch the lights out would, because 8600 here it's not only the lights for her face it's also almost creates a a string of line bleeding through the wheat field if we yeah. retouch out that would that look as has this finesse as yours it's well, a trade-off people yeah, need to make there, right? right so you're always yeah. trying to be creative within what uh tools you have on hand at that time and so if you had it too close you know obviously because of the fact that we're using these and we've got these snoots on them here or whatever you want to mm -hmm. call this dish right 
Mm -hmm. We're trying to keep it so that its direction comes across, but we, we don't want the fall off that would naturally occur right here to be in the shot. You know, we want this area lit going all the way over to where they're going to be. You know, looking at it from this perspective here, you know, we want the light to be hitting all this area right here. If you can see my mouse. So we want to light up that area right there. And if this light's yeah. moving closer, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall off. And so it's going to start to bend yet on the edge there. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, there yep. is a difference, I guess. There, well, absolutely. I mean, a yeah. tool a tool solves a particular problem. That's the beautiful thing about it. Yeah. Uh, you know, but for some people, they may not either want that or they may not. Uh, just, they may want to be more portable. You know. Yeah. And the six hundred, the wonderful, uh, wonderful light yeah. for having power. Yeah. And portable. So. This next shot we're going to show you was shot in a parking lot. One of the beautiful things about the pandemic is there's all these corporate uh, parking lots that are empty right now because everybody's working from home. And some of them have beautiful, uh, beautiful landscape. So for this one that we did here, this is shot with two 80-1200s. One is placed in front of her or to the side of her here and uh, on this side. And one is placed behind her just to help give us a little bit of separation and make her stand out from the picture, but that one was dialed way down. We wanted to have a little light coming through the bottom of her, her dress to make it feel kind of translucent there so it didn't just go dark in the background. And so that's what that light's purpose really was. But the primary light for this picture was definitely the octobox that we had very close to her on the side. And so this is what it looked like straight out of camera. So you can see that we had a screen here. There's some signs in the background. We actually have her standing directly in front of a light pole. So that's how we figured out where we need to position her pad and her body is to, to blot out the light pole that's behind her. And then, hey, hello from Ghana. I don't speak your language, I apologize. I only know a little bit from uh, from Senegal, which is Wolof, which I think we would say Nandi Def is how you say hello. So I don't know if you speak any Wolof, my friend in Ghana, but if you do, perhaps you speak some French, bonjour. Uh, so, so doing the shot in a parking lot, you wind up with something like this. You know, you got to take your side and stretch it out a little bit. You got to remove the the green tree that you couldn't get rid of, and uh, and so you wind up with something like that. Yeah. And when Murrin went into the prop closet, all of a sudden this dress stood out to her. She said, "Oh, this is what I want to wear. This is the time period that we had." And I had uh, bought this uh, parasol from. Uh, off eBay when one of my daughters was getting married and I took it to England uh, with me and uh, I thought it was from the 1820s but it had actually a snap on it and we found out later that snaps were invented until about 1850. Yeah I see we got people from India and from Pakistan so I'd say namaste and I'd say Kamcho and Kamcho if you happen to be Gujarati and and uh, I can't remember for for uh, Pakistan, I feel like this is a smiley. It's Kseho, I think is how you say it. Anyways, probably butchering all this stuff, but hello to everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, key thing here is that you know her hand uh, holding on to the uh, hello from Russia. Uh, so you'd say Dobre uh, Dan, you say Jin Dobre is what you say, I think. So Jin Dobre, hello, hello. Uh, but just that hand pulling back on the on the on the uh, the floral fauna, you know, on the reeds there kind of makes it her feel connected to it as opposed to her just standing behind it. And then it would feel like it's just kind of like foreground and then her. And so that was just a way to kind of connect her with the foreground that she's there. And show how her eye wants to go in. Here we go. Yep. Well, I'm not as good at it. But typically our eye when it read kind of starts here and it goes down. So we want the grass to kind of bring your eye back up and around. Sorry about that. And that might see the umbrella and then maybe end up right here around the face. Yeah, so for those that are newer to photography, there's different design principles that you can employ, but circular observation is one. Uh, certainly for those countries that happen to read in an opposite manner, instead of their eye entry from here, oftentimes it enters from here. Either from the top or from the bottom, your eye can read in and around. Uh, and so that's just kind of understanding the, the gaze. And then even here, Notice the strength of her gaze, it's leading, it's not directly at the camera, camera aware. It's pointed off this direction. And so we're able to just admire her and appreciate her more so than we are uh, connected with her 
uh, like in a portrait pose. This was the one time that the sun here. Yes, it was. So again, here's the straight out of camera picture. Because we had our hair and makeup done, then we went back in the studio and said, let's just do a quick, like what we consider more of a classic portrait. And so that becomes a shot like this. Now there is kind of, you know, uh, there's a veil around her. <coughs> Excuse me. Do my sneeze cover right there. Um, there's, a veil, there's a veil that's around her there. We didn't want to make her overly bridal because she's not yet at a stage of, of getting married, but we wanted a softness to the shoulders. We wanted to bring the camera down low to really give her that strong neckline. Yeah, we kind of brought the camera down around her chest area to give her that long neck and almost shoot under her chin and make her feel kind of heroic as a woman. Mm -hmm. And then a lot more chisel on her because she's just 18, but to me in this one, she looks like she's in her 20s. Yep. So one of the things that I think that, that even kind of comes into play here, if, if I was starting out and trying to learn more about portraiture and stuff like that, you know, we talk about things, dropping the camera down, making her neck longer. What are the benefits to someone uh, to be able to see her face like this? Or in this case, we were also down from a little bit lower angle and giving her more of a chisel there. So we kind of give her some shadow down, down here. What, what, what is, what's the benefit of giving that form to someone that's youthful like that? Well, it, to me, it also makes them look thinner yep. when you bring it down to a chest area when you're shooting uh, maybe yep. three quarters or longer. So how about I say it to you like this? One of the things that you oftentimes get frustrated at when, when you see photos of essentially where people so fixate on the mask of the face and trying to get that, that all of a sudden they put essentially a head on top of just a neck. And so it makes it look like their shoulders come up too high sure. and you don't get that long length, that youthfulness uh, coming through there because it's it, a lot of times it has to do with the neck and having that. Uh, a lot of times, too, you might see people, uh, which is more popular in, in perhaps, let's say, uh, boudoir or something like that, but or, or sometimes more the glamour type look where they'll connect the chin to the neck. And it can have kind of a soft, demure look, yeah. but it also creates a visual tangency yeah. when that chin comes in relation to the shoulder. Yeah. And so that's one of the things that we try and watch out for when we're, yeah. we're doing stuff. Typically, when I talk to a model, I actually say it starts at the collarbone, even below the neck. Yep, it starts here. Yes. Yep, in terms of their posture, and then bringing those shoulders back, mm -hmm. which elongates here. And kind of pulls it all together. And then once you after you get that, then you can move your head around. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I'd say this too, if I was starting out, you know, one of the things to know is that when as as a man, if I'm looking at you here and my head goes towards my lower shoulder, it's more masculine. And when my head goes to my raised shoulder, it looks more feminine. And so as you can see here, you know, we've brought it so that this shoulder is the one from camera that's a little bit higher than this one. It's just soft. It's not overly dramatic, that angle that's there, but this shoulder being higher and this being lower gives her kind of that feminine look as she's as she's there in a similar way here. Notice that this shoulder is the one that's higher and her head happens to be turned this way. And so that gives her that feminine look versus if her head had, had come to tilt towards that lower shoulder. Yeah. Okay, so we took her then back. Okay, is the photo of a girl with an umbrella? Uh, let me see what the the thing uh, the spirit of impression. Uh, oh yes, it does have kind of that that impressionistic feeling, doesn't it? Right. So so this is probably good to talk about just quickly, and I know that we had questions about post productions as well. But just in a general sense, when you're thinking of how to interpret a photo, does that start when you open up the, the picture that you captured in Photoshop? Is that when you think no, about how to interpret it? It starts, a, it starts actually when I'm thinking about it in my head or drawing a pencil drawing. It's usually something has captured my interest. Either I was looking on Pinterest and I saw something and I go, oh my goodness, I love this time period or this. Or, or the color palette or the color uh, harmony and uh, or you're looking at paintings you're looking at anywhere yeah. that you want for inspiration yeah, absolutely in a time period and so obviously the dress that she has on there kind of reflects you know not being modern current day and so it lends itself and then the fact that it's kind of more abstracted in terms of 
there is no real background being shown. There's some, some trees in the distance there, yeah. but because you have the movement of yeah. the foliage, it, this is an image that lends itself to more of an impressionistic yeah. uh, interpretation. And I think one of the things that people oftentimes get stuck on is uh, they get lost in Photoshop. So they start off in Photoshop, they start working on something, and also they've stared at it for a long time, and then they go, now what was I doing? Where did I want to go with this? And that's always a good time to pause and stop and reflect and go back to whatever your initial idea was to begin with. This green fabric right here is covering up the parking lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I and mean, that's the problem solving, you know, in terms of how, how that's done. If we did not have, if we had not pulled this out here, then you would have seen parking lot here in the background. That's exactly right. Okay, so the next shot we went, took her back into the studio. And uh, for this, we wanted to use our continuous lights. Mm -hmm. And so this is a theme that we've done different variations on over time, but the idea behind it really comes to uh, if, you, if you got that message, whether that was you were reading a letter from someone mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they had something tragic to say to you or the phone rings. Yeah. Uh, I, for, for me, I was thinking that she was ironing her special dress for like maybe excited to be going out on a date when she gets the phone call, it says it's all falling apart. Yeah. So, so however you'd want to interpret it, you know, there's kind of a duality. There's the artist's intent of what you're trying to do. But the question is, as the observer, as the viewer, you know, what do you see here? You know, and, and I would say the things that you would describe just right offhand is you go, I see that there's an iron that's in her hand. I see that there's a, a phone that's on the ground. There's a time period, obviously, that's being reflected to this, which takes it both, it, it's a modern in the sense of we have phones today, but they're also specific type phones. It's a rotary phone. And uh, and then obviously the fan itself. Well, I, I, the props are from the 1940s. Yep, and then the, the iron itself is from a time period. So you kind of pull those elements together to get the time period. The set we built, we went very monochromatic intentionally because this is one where we're starting to get into color theory. And color theory being just uh, there's different things. If, if, if you watch some of our other videos, uh, certainly uh, we go into more detail there. I don't want to overwhelm people here, but what you should know is color is one of the ways we can create visual impact. So we can create it both uh, with something like this, where we basically make everything within the scene go very secondary because we've gone very monochromatic with, with all the elements, the chair, the table, uh, the walls, the floor. Yep. Now I guess color scheme. Yep. So we use these lights here, and we also use the S30, but we use the SL200s in order to be able to accomplish this shot. What we did here, this is the straight out of camera. What we did straight out of camera, let me make sure I pull up our metadata, which is always, you know, as you, as you continue on your journey, you'll find that the metadata is some of the least interesting conversations, but when you're starting your journey, it's some of the most essential because you're looking for road markers. Yeah. You're looking for things that kind of tell you like, go 55 on this road, <laughs> you know, things that, that help you get, get, get along down the process. So for this one, we shot at ISO 200, it was shot at F56, it was shot at a 30th of a second, and it was using a 24 millimeter lens. And you can see there that we have a light that's up in the top corner that's kind of coming to be our, our separation light that's hitting her here, coming down from up there. But that's not all the lights we used. Uh, the other lights that we used, as you can kind of see from here, we've, we've flagged off our windows there inside of our garage. Uh, so basically, our studio is, is above our garage is the correct way to say it. And so we don't want those lights to always come through there. We want the lights that we're meaning to use to work. There's actually right here, you're going to see there's a gridded light. And so when we come around from this side here, you can see we boomed this light in so that we could come in and be able to get our separation light. And then we've got our grid light here that's coming to strike her. The way that it's angled is we're trying to do it so it kind of spills across her. Dad talked about it earlier being a feathered light. We didn't want to have too much light hitting the foreground. Yeah, and there was a little bit of light that was uh, falling off her feet just a little too much. I really wanted to show the angular awkwardness of the legs. Yep. Yeah. And so in order to accomplish that, we then took one more light and we bounced it into a reflector down here because we wanted that light to be a bit more diffused than directional. We still wanted it coming from the same direction, but what we wanted it to do is not have the same intensity to it that the other lights uh, are, are our main light. And so that's how you get something that looks like, blow it up this, I can blow it up, yep. 
I was going to go back to this one right here, which is kind of that straight out of camera type shot to also talk about just even set building. If you're just trying to do something very simple, all you need is uh, some panels of some type, a wall. Yeah, we just painted the wall. Yeah, we just painted this wall on the background. And then we had a wall panel that we had built. This is just a, a board base or a board, you know, that's being painted and, and just set across a board painted and just set across. And then the same thing, just some thin masonite that's been painted and laid down for the ground. And so that's, that's how you create a scene that looks like this. Cause you know that this is all you're going to actually show from your frame, yeah. you know? So that's kind of how to demystify, you know, that process. Uh, are there any questions there on that that have come in, Aries? Or are we good? Or do you have a question there on that? Aries, <laughs> I think I can't hear you, my friend. Sorry, I'll, I'll, sorry I mute myself yeah, no uh, <laughs> during the talk. Um, so I, I actually have a story. Uh, sorry, I have a question about the story. Like she's holding this ironing thing and she's making the telephone call. Like it's just she's too much work. Me. She's. Yeah. Yeah. You feel the depression, and um, yeah. If you could talk talk about the story or the artistic reference behind it, um, that yep. would so be awesome. The, the, the depression she feels, I would say, is is it's somewhat emotive from her face, somewhat. But I would say it's primarily conveyed by her gesture, right? That that's what's conveying the fact that she literally has stopped the action we would expect her to be in, and she just has had to collapse. We don't know what message it was that she got on the other side of the phone. We could tell you as the artist what we are yeah. suggesting it is that she was perhaps stood up on a date or yeah. something along those lines. But all of us have had times where we've received the phone call that had yeah. bad news. And, and this is part of an artist statement, whether it's frustrated at the uh, train station or receiving disappointment. And it all started actually with uh, my mother who was married at 19 and was a widow at 20 and just hearing the bad news of a, a spouse's death and, and what happens when you receive that news. And, so, and, and her husband that died was not my, my grandfather, my dad's father, but it is a story that, that certainly was passed on because that is rather traumatic to get married. You're full of excitement. And in his particular case, he had a polyp in his nose, and, and this is, you know, obviously uh, pre-World War II, but he had gone into the, the doctor not expecting anything, and that polyp at that time had, had burst in his nose, and he died on the, on the, on the, at the doctor's office when he was just going to get it investigated. And so, that's close. <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> however, yeah. but point, point being that we've all had tragedies or things that, that happened to us where we received news, and so this was one way of conveying it. And we have done others in the past where we've had somebody reading a letter or doing different things. However you want to receive news, uh, it can be sent to you. Yeah. Here uh, we have another question regarding yep. from Charlie. Yep. Do you know what lighting you will need or is it trial and error? So the answer is yes, we know what lighting we will need. And that is experience. Um, Generally speaking, we may not know. Um, let's say if we, let's say we're going to use five lights to do something, we may know uh, going into it the four lights that we're planning on using, and the fifth light is off. Oh, we need to solve, to solve a particular problem. So, for instance, here we knew that we needed to have this light here. We needed to have this light here. Uh, we even had a light over to this side here that was just bouncing up again, controlling the ratio so it wasn't as directional and softening the shadows. But this light here for her foot, that wasn't a light that you realized you had no to solve. Idea. Yeah, until all of a sudden you get into the, looking at your, your test and you say, this area is going too dark on her legs. I have too much fall up. Now, one way to have solved that could have been Lower that. lowering this and or even taking out the grid. But particularly for what we were uh, pre-visualizing, we knew that we wanted this area back here to go a bit darker and become yeah. secondary. Yeah. So that was part of the desire to keep Absolutely. the grid on there. And the grid, you know, keep a narrow beam of light. But you know what I did when I put that light up there? I should have put it on a arm yeah. so it, to lower it. Now that I look at it, I really didn't need that extra light had I lowered 
that light. Yeah. But in the moment, you, you're you trying yeah. to solve 10 problems. And yep. So so what he's saying there is that the, the C stand itself can only go so low. And that's where if he had had an arm, he couldn't reduce the height of the C stand. So if he had an arm, he could have then, you know, put it at an angle, just like we put this one at an angle and gotten it down lower to where that light would have accomplished that. And I think sometimes, you know, the whole, the whole job of, of photographer, besides the psychology that we do with the people in front of our cameras is problem solving. It's visual problem solving. And then looking at what it is that the camera captures and determining if it is, um, if it matches what your vision was going into the shot. Yeah. And if it does, then you move forward. If it doesn't, then you figure out how do I back into fixing yeah. whatever it is that I need to Can you go back to the big picture, Luke. I want to show them a tangency to, to the final one. To the final one? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, go do 200% on the, on the tip of the iron. Look, yep. See. Right here. You see where it's hitting the cloth and they, they, they intersect like that? That's called a tangency. And that's a big mistake. Had that iron gone down another quarter of an inch or a half an inch, it would have made it stronger. Yep. So in other words, if we had allowed the iron in her hand to fall down so that the tip of it broke the edge of this, it would have given it a better shape and would have helped to avoid the tangency that he's talking about here. There are, uh, let's say eight different types of visual tangencies. If you were to just Google visual tangencies and how to problem solve them, you'll be able to, to learn that. Uh, but the one that's here is, is an abutment issue where two things are kissing off of each other. Even here, yeah, if we had let the phone come even just a little bit further over into this area, it's somewhat uh, uh, less offensive because of the fact that there's the shadow there that's coming in. And then the other thing that you have to figure out when you have a circle like this is where do you want to put this line? And that's where we were primarily fixating our eyes on is camera position in relation to how we wanted this line to come in and intersect with her head so it wasn't as offensive. And during our summer internship, this was her very first shot. So it was almost getting accustomed to shooting together again. Yep. So, yep. May I ask what that mirror or round frame behind refers to? Yep. So the purpose of the mirror, uh, it's just a visual. architectural, uh, yeah, yeah, it's architectural, architectural just, element. Yeah. And as a, a style that was popular in the forties. Yeah. So, I mean, for, oh, since I know that you're, you're playing on such a high level here in this, in this particular case, it, it almost is confirming forms. So because we have the circle that's been introduced here with the, uh, the fan, there is the repetition of the circle confirms for you the presence of circles within this picture. Sure. And then even the fact that we know that this table is circular in the way that it is. So it, it's just uh, confirming forms is something you yeah. can explore. Show sure, the triangles. So well, we'll, yeah. Boom. boom. Yeah. 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 It, it, it's just a, a graphic boom, reference. Boom, 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 yeah. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Okay. I need to see what uh, Mr. Don's question was. When do you know you want to use continuous versus strobes or as a preference when you do the shoot? Yep. So we love shooting with continuous. We love shooting with continuous. Uh, first of all, it's fast, easy. You can see exactly what's going on. Uh, and then you don't have any recycle times. And five years ago, the LEDs were not bright enough. But now we've got these new like 200 watts which many times I actually have to turn them down just a little bit because they're almost too, too powerful bright. now. Yeah, if you, if you want to have a more shallow depth of field, for sure. Um, but well, I like having that kind of power if I need it. But in terms of problem solving, going out into the field or, or go, approaching a photo shoot, I'll give you an example today. My dad and I were going to go do a, a, a photo shoot, and, uh, and it was a bridal portrait, and we decided we were going to use the 600s, uh, for our shoot, and so we packed those in the car, but then we decided to go ahead and put the two 1200s in the car, uh, just in case, because we knew that potentially we were gonna have to be shooting, our shoot was supposed to be from 12 to two, and uh, middle, of the day. middle of the day, it was gonna be interior primarily, but then they wanted to do some outdoor, outdoor shots. As fate would have it, the 1200s remained in our car, and when we did our outdoor shots, we ended up doing them with the 600s. Uh, because they still had enough power. We just had to bring them closer. Uh, you know, we had to take the diffusion off the front of our soft box in order to allow that light to strike the subject just a, a bit more. 
But at that point, the shoot is kind of that last 15 minutes where they go, okay, can we quickly go out and get our, our, our shots? If the purpose of the shoot had been, let's go shoot outdoors as our primary shooting area, we would have said, then let's start with the 1200s yeah. just so that we had that extra power available to us if we needed. I'd almost describe it as, as uh, you know, having extra power is like uh, driving on the highway. And when you need to be able to hit the gas to get out of a problem quick, it's nice to be able to have that extra power there. Uh, can you uh, find a way to wiggle your way out? Absolutely, when you have less power. Uh, but uh, you know, when we're shooting in the studio, a lot of times we love the quality of the light that comes from continuous. There's just a softness to us that, that really works, in our opinion, in terms of, of what we're going for. Absolutely. And so we love shooting continuous when we're inside the studio and it's, and it's that luxury. And Luke and I both came out of theater backgrounds too, so that was just part of the theater preference. Yep. It's the mirror placed low on purpose. Absolutely. So the, the position of the mirror was in relation to the composition. And if you go back to the original shot, you can see where the seamless didn't go all the way up in the mirror. Yep. So, okay. Yeah. So here's another thing. If you are a beginner and you're trying to learn stuff. So in order to not have the mirror show things behind us. Like us. Like <laughs> us. Yeah. You know, what we did here is, so here's the camera and between the camera and our lights, we then pulled down a roll of seamless. This is us as we were starting to try and set up everything and start trying to figure out there's the mirror, get ready to hang it type stuff. Uh, the seamless literally went right to the camera lens. Yep, it was the seamless we pulled down to right here. So what that basically looks like here is you can see there's our roll of seamless being pulled down and that just cuts the reflection down to where it's just continuous tone. And, and Luke said, for us to do this right in camera, we need to get some higher seamless stands. And I said, I'll just fix it in post. So. Yeah, I did. I, <laughs> I said to him, I go, Dad, our, our seamless stand would only go up so high in terms of our, because our camera position's down low. And I'm going, we need to raise the seamless up so that we don't see this line. And he's like, this high little go. <laughs> so I'll fix it in post. I'm like, we can move it. Ah, let's go. And so that just gives you something that ultimately you're able just to then make look something like this. So... Let's go into this shot here, because this is a, a great one. And this is the one that we show your post-production. How many light sources were used? Five? Uh, for this one right here, we've got one, two, three, four, four lights. So we have the light that's coming from the top here to give her separation. We have the gridded light. We have the light that was down, down here for her legs. And then we have one light that's positioned over on this side, which I'll make it easy for you to be able to see. So it would have been positioned over here and it's just shooting up into the ceiling so that it can just open up what our shadows are. And that top light's an S30. Yeah, that top light is. Yeah. And and for that, how many percent are you you prepare for camera setting and editing? How many percent? I think what you're asking us is is, you know, how how bright do we turn these lights up? Is that a, a fair a fair guess there? You know, what is the, the light setting? And I would say to you on the S30, we had dialed it down to probably 30% uh, from memory because we didn't want it to uh, overpower it. Yeah, and the other ones we probably set at, would you guess, 80% brightness? Probably. Yeah, 80% brightness. So we're not using the full range of the power that can come from the 200. We just needed enough depth of field to go from the phone to the back mirror. Yep. So, Let's go to this shot real quick, because this is the one that we do the post-production uh, examples for you on. So this was shot with the, the VL, or the, excuse me, I keep doing this wrong, the FV200, uh, which all you need to know is it's the continuous light that also has the built-in strobe possibilities. And, uh, and so that becomes really nice just to get that little extra, if you need that little extra power uh, to come in, you can make it uh, fire as if it was a strobe. And so, you know, uh, for this particular light, how did you like this, or for this particular shot, how did you like this shot? It was almost similar to the uh, way that we lit the uh, previous shot with the iron board. So in other words, Very a, a light coming from back here for separation, a light coming from the side here, which would have been the FB, and then uh, having a light that's going to fill the control the ratios. Yeah, let me just give you a little backstory on this. Her grandmother, who's a sweet friend of mine, uh, asked Murrin to wear her wedding dress, and Murrin, being a young 18-year-old, didn't want to do kind of a bridal-type shot. So we were trying to come up with a story that would uh, 
tell them about. Uh, so Great Expectations is a book that she loves. And so we were trying to, I believe her name is Mrs. or Miss Hagersham or something like that, who before her wedding, her husband uh, dies. And so they still had the wedding cake and everything had been covered with dust and spider webs. And, uh, and she just couldn't get past the fact that uh, her husband died right before their wedding day. Yep. So bringing in the military jacket here, the military hat, because you're trying to be suggestive of a husband, the vase is turned over, the spider webs, the veil, the, 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 whatever you want to look, the stream that's on the face. Uh, there were mice running through everything. Yep. One of the, th one of the <laughs> things that's just kind of like, when you talk about, uh, when we say in terms of fine art, like a unified, unified series of things, one of the things that you'll find is a lot of times we incorporate mice in our shot. Uh, we did a, a thing for Godox on Henry Peach Robinson with the Godox V1, and you'll notice in that shot we included the mice. We, we put them in so subtly you'll have to really see. Them. Yep, but, but it's just kind of that little that reoccurring theme that we we bring throughout the different shots yeah. as just being kind of like a I don't know a fingerprint of sorts. Yeah. A signature type thing, a tell uh, hmm. of who the who the author was, who who's the creator. So, so what's the what's the vase that the lavender is referring to? It's just interesting. The vase being turned those. over. Yeah. Yeah, it just suggests to you that things are not right. Obviously, this is a disturbing image in the way that it's being portrayed. It's using the exact same set that we had, had used before, using the exact same mirror. But you know what makes this image striking really has to do with its composition and the use of dominant mass. The fact that he's got this weight down here at the bottom. You had your triangle. Yep. Yep. But the heaviness of the weight that you've got down here has a real dominant lurking mass to it. So when we first look at this, we don't know whether to be frightened or startled. And the question becomes: Were these used, uh, or the spider webs added in post-production? Yes. So why don't we go ahead and, and I'll put this picture up so you can see what it looked like straight out of camera. And, uh, and then uh, the uh, aperture for this one was 7.1. The shutter speed was 2 50th of a second. And it was shot at ISO 200 with a 35 millimeter. And why don't you start with the one minute video? Uh, can I even say something before you start? Um, we were trying to get uh, expand Murren's uh, ability to emote and uh, anyway and so we this was uh luke's grandfather's military jacket and when we brought it in and laid it by her feet she actually started crying yeah so it's just a, a really uh, she was able to actually accomplish that well yeah. so let's watch our one minute version of the video and then if people need us to slow down dad if you can narrate uh for us just a bit kind of what your thought process is as you were going in to do the post production on this yep yeah do you want me to play it or? Please, yes. Okay, sure. Give me one sec, really quick. Do I need to share the audio or no? There's no audio. Dad's gonna voice over for you. You can describe it. Okay, thing. sure. I'm gonna cool. try. I'll... Yep. Can you guys see it? Yep. All right, here we go. So the first thing that you do is you kind of open it up and you start doing what? So I, I basically have areas that I can open up my uh, shadow detail. So I basically open up some areas. I was erasing some areas of the spider webs because the spider webs were supposed to be a hinder. I was transforming some spider webs, but then I was going to erase it around her uh, dress and, and the clothing, which I think I did there. Apparently a little more transforming. Again, just this kind of feeling of grunge and just a grungy room that had not been cleaned and according to the book, maybe in like 40 or 50 years. So anyway, I was trying to get that real dirty kind of feel to the whole thing. Yep. Now you're taking it into a different program. This is Topaz, mm -hmm. correct? It is. Yep. And I love Topaz. I, I use it a lot. I'm just deciding which one of these filters do I want. And uh, sometimes what I do is I'll pick one and actually reduce it by 50%, and then I'll actually put the old layer underneath it, then I'll erase part of the top layer and blend the two. Yep. And then that gives you the final version. So what I would say to you here is if you'd like, uh, we also have the three minute and the six minute version. I know that we only have about 20 minutes left, I don't want to spend too much time on post-production here. 
But if there's any questions, if we need to slow that down just a little bit, just know that that's an opportunity. Yep. Yep. So here's a question. Could you achieve the same lighting effect of the last two images by using a two light system and positioning bouncing lights from a reflector rather than using four lights? Or ideally you would need four lights for a full effect. And I would say to you, my thought, Absolutely. You could, but you'd be it'd be much easier to do with four. Yeah, yeah. But I think of the photographers who do, if, have if you, space yes. or something. Um, if you didn't have four lights, you could pull that off using reflectors. You're just going to have to take a lot more time because you're playing jump. You know, you're playing uh, physics, right? You got to make sure everything's just bouncing, reflecting, just right. Playing pool. Playing pool. So you just got to make sure everything's placed in the in the in the right areas, uh, but yeah, definitely two lights would be able to accomplish what it is that you need. And and by the way, it's good to see you. Yep. Okay. So you know we had a question about post production before. What are the programs that you like to use? Um, and what is Topaz? Topaz is a program, and I'm not sure what, it's not the impressions ones that I use. I'm probably going to have to go run to my office and see which one I use. Okay, you run to your office. I'll, I'll, I'll take over. I don't know, but I'll okay. come back with an answer. So here's the thing that you should know about David in terms of the way he does his post-production. He's very much an artist in the process. Some people are very technical, and, uh, and so that's a, a good thing, but they do things in a very systematic way. Dad is much more like a chef in a kitchen, so he just salt and peppers to taste. Uh, the programs that he uses are just things that you can use to leverage for a particular thing. Topaz is a suite. If you if you typed in Topaz plugins, you would be able to find their suite of plugins. The particular one that you used here, Topaz Studio. Topaz Studio, which Topaz Studio contains Topaz impressions, uh, and so that uh, that's why I'm thinking of, of Topaz impressions. Uh, but then you also like using Nick filters sometimes Very much. when you're doing. Uh, if we were watching that video again, you saw him doing his opening up shadows in different areas and stuff like that. Somebody who is very technical is going to say, well, can't you do X, Y, and Z in Lightroom before you open the raw file? Can't you do X, Y, and Z in Photoshop? Can't you do da, da, da? There's a thousand different ways to get to the final result. None of them is superior to the other, other than in the sense of what works in your workflow, unless it solves a particular problem for you. I, I'm a guy that just salt and peppers the things. I wonder. <laughs> I think I said those exact words, but you do, and uh, and I admire that about you, actually, because you go in and you look at it and you season something so that it reflects the way that you wanted it to be presented more so than you uh, go into it thinking it always has to look exactly a, a particular result. So sometimes you might go darker, or you might yeah. go heavier on the texture, or heavier on on uh, retouching or liquefying yeah. or whatever. Other times you do and, less. And not all of these are successes. We we like to push ourselves, and when you're really pushing yourself past the comfort level, I bet 50% of your images will be failures. Yeah. But you learn from the failure. Absolutely, Prachi. Uh, okay, for us to share back the screen again, do I need to hit stop share screen on my end, or do you hit it? No, um, which one do you want to? I was going to go back to the presentation. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So, what else can we do in the studio like that? Well, you know, this was playing off the idea of Caravaggio, and uh, and creating a shot like that. This is just using how many lights, Dad? Um, one, probably three. Uh, one, one to light the the, the face and and the. Uh, uh, and the whole gathering, what do you call that? The harvest? Yeah. The bouquet? And then there was just one kind of a, a, a Colt 45 beam that was sitting in the background and probably then a... a so like a tighter type tight snoot. Uh -huh. Yep. And then there was one probably just to control the contrast. It yep. was just hitting the ceiling. But the, the reason to use that more snooty type light was to have what? This type lighting on her face here, the more chiseled type lighting yeah. on her face. Now, right. a, a woman that I met her actually, she had come in the evening before, and uh, and I said, uh, "Hey, my my intern's coming in the morning. This probably took four minutes to shoot, and then she, then we went back to work." Yeah. Uh, and then I'll show you just a couple more real quick that are just finishing out this series with this girl. So this is taking it more into the fantasy type realm. Uh, this is photoshopping in the background. 
and, and putting her within a scene and just lighting her in the studio. These are others that are just us playing around when we're there, playing with desaturated looks. Uh, the one on the left of her with the with the, the shirt was actually us getting ready for a, a, a high school senior that was going to be a paying client. Uh, we weren't going to do her in this desaturated way, but we wanted to see how the stool would work and just kind of the idea of the black turtleneck. Uh, and then, you know, on the right hand side, that's just photographers being photographers, having just the weird, uh, weird things and just taking pictures. Um. Aries, I bought $700 worth of masks just for my grandchildren because they were in Italy and I knew that they were not going to be able to speak English and I wanted to do a book and help them to learn English. Well, actually, English is their first language, even over in Italy. <laughs> and uh, so, so I've never been able to use the mask, but uh, again, she didn't want to look like a bride, so we put a uh, rhinoceros in on her. Yep. So I'm going to go into some of the stuff we've done with the with the 600 pro and uh and we love these you know we love modifiers hear me very clearly we love modifiers but you don't need a modifier in order to go out and shoot things so be it, this is two bare bulb 600s and i shot this specifically in ttl just to say well, you know if somebody was not trying to figure out how to do math or are not ready for ratios uh, in the sense of saying, I want to set it at a quarter power or half power or full power. They just wanted TTL. Uh, I, the camera, uh, the, the, the 600 that was over here on the side that was lighting her face, getting her shape and form, that one was set to plus one for the TTL. So I really wanted it to overpower, over push in the scene. And the one that I had put over to the right of the camera, I had set that one at negative two, because I just wanted it just to add just a little fill light so that it wasn't overly directional. So I just softened some of these ratios. And my mental vision for how this picture was going to ultimately be is I saw her, uh, this was a different girl that we were shooting. And I, okay. Jessica, I saw her very much as like a piece of, you know, call it the resistance of a strong woman, the revolution, you know, all this kinds of stuff. But I saw her in this kind of more uh, like she was a button that was being worn on somebody's jacket or, or something like that, that she represented an idea, you know, behind her with her strength. So I saw her uh, and I wanted to present her in a very circular manner. Uh, five minutes after that shot, uh, went and moved over to a different spot, switched out her fabric, switched out her top, grabbed the chains. And, you know, the funny thing about the chains is, our eye, when we look at something, believes something has mass to it. What do I mean by mass? It has weight to it. So these are plastic chains. Like, like you would buy for Halloween. Yeah, for Halloween, right? But be, the, 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 you know, if you put the actual physical chains on her, she probably couldn't lift her arm and, and do that kind of stuff. But I knew that I wanted to create this shape and this bend and that she was having to reach to something and reaching out. Uh, and just that tension as she was almost like she was growing up out of out of the ground. And so this kind of gives you an idea to do a little liquefy here on uh, on the fabric. And uh, and so boom, Bob's your uncle. Another one that we did with the 600 would have been a shot like this in the studio. And so, you know, the shot on the left, she doesn't even need to wear pants because, you know, you're going to crop in. She had on shorts, of course, but the key was to get her hair done in the proper way so that the fish could then be shot and be put on top of her, almost as if she was smelling like something fishy is going on around here. That's exactly right. Yeah. So uh. every you see fish, it's either kind of a fishy smell or what's going on, or you know there's fish on your head. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, more that we did with, uh, with Jessica, just to show people just kind of straight out of camera versus, you know, interpretation. You know, this is just her shot against just a simple background sitting down. And then you've got the, the final result. Uh, something like this we wanted to show because we want to show people, you know, you're having to use booms and stuff to kind of come in here and, and hold things in place. And the clamp that's up here at the top, you know, to be able to get this because she's really wearing it. And then the final part becomes then going into Photoshop and then doing your skin tone uh, work and then your final color grading. Yeah. And the makeup artist said, Give me just a little time. I'll go ahead and put all her hair up under the clamshell. I said, I, I can do it faster. <laughs> I can do it faster in post. Yeah. Uh, another one on, on getting into some set building. You know, we didn't want to go too heavy on set building with this talk. 
but you know, sets are a great way for you to define a space. And so this would be more of a simple set, uh, turning uh, the checkerboard pattern at an angle. And now you've got the diagonals instead of the rows uh, coming in. And then of course, you know, you just do your, your foam core walls in the background and, uh, and create a shot like this. And you just figure out where you need to arrange your elements. Uh, you can go into more fantasy in the way that you do stuff, uh, which would be a shot like this. And so from, from a shot like this, all you have to do is then on the post, come in and Photoshop whatever your scene is that's going to be outside the window. You can see that we've got the gridded lights. We've got the rim light coming in to be able to hit her. And we had light coming through the uh, And we had light. That, we had to have light that gave kind of a translucent feel uh, here in terms of, of the window frame that we had built for the set. Uh, yeah. Just for, the audience, just for the audience here, uh, how many lights were we were using in the previous image? And um, yeah, what lights and what each light's for? Yeah. So how many lights were being used in this shot? I'm okay. going to guess I'm, four. Uh, I would say three or four. Three or four. Yeah, you've got obviously the one directional one here. You've got this one yeah. here comes the rim. You've got one here. And then the question becomes, did he end up bouncing? On? I'm going to guess actually three because I don't see our ceiling lit up here, yeah. which says to me you probably weren't bouncing light yeah. in. But usually, I put a, even though we have window light on the other side, I usually You'll put, put an LED D. to kind of add that little extra. Yeah, because yeah. you want to create the illusion that whatever it is here is creating some light here, but you also have some light that, you know, it's not justified, but you're using it to, you want to shape this person here as opposed to letting them go into darkness so that they kind of become almost cut out within the scene and that gives them their dominance within the scene. I was trying to, come. I, yeah. I didn't elongate her, all I did was just change the shape of her hips to kind of give her that kind of thin and elongated yep. feel that I was. Yep, but the whole point is, is that separation light is being put here to kind of make it so that she doesn't blend in with the background and it doesn't go so dark here that the picture becomes heavy on the right hand side. We want the eye to go to the person and what's happening with the person and then realize that they're within that particular scene. Yeah. And trying to play off the complementary colors too that ba basically make the red just a little twinge off to make it more orangey. Aries, you had a question? Yeah, I was wondering why we use um, the front light, the field light, and why we use grid just for the audience here. Yeah, so grid just helps you get a very directional, very contrasty light. Uh, and uh, a snoot or something like that also does a narrow beam of light. So you can see here where that light here is coming and hitting on her hair right here and hitting on her shoulders. I was going to disagree with you barely. I think this light, the grid light, is bouncing this way to just open up a little bit of shadow detail. Yeah, you know, he's talking about like what is the purpose of a grid light in general. Oh, thank you. Yeah, why would you use yeah. a grid light? Yeah, for why would you use a snoot, right? Uh, so, mm. you know, in basic photography senses, the larger your light source, the closer your light source, the softer the light. The further the light is from your subject, or the smaller it is, then the harsher. And what do we mean by harsher? It means it casts a harder shadow. So a soft light casts a very soft shadow. A, uh, a harsh light creates a very harsh light, much like if you went outside in the middle of the day and you look at any shadow around, as opposed to on an overcast day where you realize all the, the shadows are very soft. But when you have a big light source, it can also have still, and those uh, grids help keep it more defined. Yeah, and that's that's what you do when you. So if you're using a gridded light source, and you want that soft quality in the direction of your light, but you don't want the light spilling out everywhere, that's what the grid comes in handy for. And I remember when we first started using grids, it really messed with you because you had gotten so accustomed to not using grids and figuring out how to feather and and do different things that also the grid added so much contrast to the shots that you were going, I need to do something. And that's why we ended up adding more of a bounce light into a ceiling to then lessen the ratios that way. Yeah. Um, Here, here's a question for Ron. Steve. Yeah. Well, do you want to go through Steve's question or do you want to go through your question? Hey, Steve. So let's answer Steve real quick. So. You know, Steve's asking a leading question, and I appreciate that, but... Because nobody knows better than Steve. Steve. Steve knows composition so well, but the question being, do we uh, build a set and compose or uh, and, and, and figure it out on the back end, or do we sketch the design first and then build? And the answer is you always start by sketching out first, 
right? And then you build uh, because that's how you know what to build, how to problem solve. Uh, you know, oftentimes you start with, you know, the initial ideas that you want to explore. From there, you'll actually light the scene within your head. You'll figure out any number of different variables. What are your colors? Uh, what are the right objects within a scene? You know, the trick within symbolism is oftentimes you want to use as few symbols as possible. If this was too busy a scene over here, uh, then it may distract you, but just having single element, her element, and then the window as an element uh, kind of creates this interesting walk here as you kind of go in kind of this zigzag pattern as you go through the composition. So that's all something you intentionally think out of. Absolutely. Yep. Steve, I, I believe you do too. <laughs> I know you do. Uh, well, I know, I know he's good at being able to, uh, to uh, see, uh, see composition. Yeah, everybody so. wishes they could. Yep. Shit like and this is just more just doing very simple stuff, simple stuff, simple backgrounds, whether you're adding the texture in Photoshop or if you're just blurring it in the background. And we were going to end with just kind of taking into just a little bit more complexity for people to show what could you do, right? So maybe this is something to inspire you to do. So let's say that you wanted to do something, but you didn't have enough money to build an entire set. Well, you could just build half the set and then you take the other half and you flip it in post and you complete the shape, right? So only things that were built were this wall and this wall, and then this wall is just put in in post, and this wall is put in in post, and you complete the scene. I actually had the material. It's just that she called and said, I can only do it on this day, and I thought, I haven't finished the set. <laughs> and I said, come on, I'll just, I'll just re I'll build it later. But if, I, but if I was if, if I was starting out, I'd wanna know that I can get by with just having only Absolutely. certain parts of a puzzle to create my finished yep. picture. Yep. And so this is just a backdrop that's hanging in the background, and then you have the person that's in here. You gotta make sure that whatever you have them sitting on is wide enough to support their weight uh, so they can fit comfortably. You know, having the separation between the legs is triangle is key. One of the things that you'll learn is you don't want the light underneath here being too bright. Otherwise, this would become a visual trap, just like this could become a visual trap, or this could become a visual trap. So you tone those areas down, you let them go darker. While studying art history, it was time to study Maxfield Parish. So I was trying to get these kind of parish blues. Yep. Uh, if you want to go in more Renaissance in your look, you know, this is a set. These are all being built in the same above a garage type space. Um, you know, uh, more in the style of Vermeer. You've got the light coming from the left. You've got a leaded glass window. Uh, you put your roof in, which is this actual physical wood being put in here. You've got your fabric that you've you've uh, put there. The only thing that ended up in post realizing needed to be refined somewhat ultimately was what? Another tangency. Yeah. So <laughs> and, and walk through that. Well, look look at this. This post was almost kind of at the same height as her head. It, not quite a tangency, but it's too close. So I ended up. Um, just enlarging her a little bit so this would break a little bit more towards the back of the neck. And from a proportion standpoint, from a scale standpoint, it gives her more dominance within the frame. She's being lost a little bit within the scene here, but then by increasing the scale of, of her in post, she now has the dominance that was the original intent. And unless you know what you're going for going into it and how to, because the problem solving doesn't stop after the capture. The problem solving stops once you've completed a picture. Yeah. yeah. But again, again, this is just part of trying to do everything where we don't have to Photoshop anything. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another quick one just to show you was just a, a simple set like this. However, this simple set was done on three different layers. This is the straight out of camera capture. So you build a wall as a plane. You build a secondary wall that's spaced about 12 feet back. And then you build a third wall behind that, another 10 feet back, and you just have that suggestion of color. The backdrop of the sky yep. behind that. Yep. And all we were able to do in this scene was be able to light. We had a light coming here to strike her. We had a light uh, behind me as the camera operator just doing fill. And then we had uh, a light coming from back here to be able to strike on him and also on this wall. And those lights were boomed up high above the walls. So they could then shoot down over them because these walls are only eight feet tall, which is why you can see right there the top of the wall. And of course, in the finished version of the picture, then you just have to come and digitally stretch to fix that area that you go, well, nothing I can do about that. Yep. Unless I wanted to build a, a much higher set. 
And uh, shooting inside the same studio here inside of our home, shot with dad. Bringing in, that's the actual straight out of camera shot. So you can kind of get just kind of a feeling of how to do it. You know, there's a light being placed back here, striking on this wall. There's a light that's coming from over here, striking him. There's a light that's put back in this corner that's shooting back this direction to give us that light that spills on the floor and gives us those highlights, which we wanted to be able to have. It's called a rake light uh, in film terms, but there's different terms you could use. And my, the basic humor in all this is that uh, it was, uh, if you can blow it up big, the yeah. magazine basically was a kind of a French maid who says, I'll do all the dirty work. And so I ordered one and I actually got a real maid. <laughs> yeah. So it's playing off the idea of a man who's at the hotel and he rings up the front desk, <laughs> has some sort of code, but then it's missed expectations. Let's just call it that, missed expectations. And, uh, yeah. you know, we always joke that the woman here uh, who played the role, who's the punchline, so to speak, she's actually a theater teacher. And it, you have to have the right relationship with someone to be able to say, hey, can you be the punchline in a gag? But, you know, for the right personality, they go, absolutely. Like, I totally get it. We're not trying to uh, poke fun at her. It's just playing, playing a part, much like an actress would play a part. Uh, you know, this is a shot that we, uh, people have seen us uh, show before, just to kind of show the, the background behind this. You know, the idea being that he's enamored by the picture on the back wall, which, you know, ultimately that's probably, you know, his wife's saying, I'm waiting. She's written on the lipstick, but there's this other girl that he's got as his fantasy. Well, the story, the story is he's come home like a salesman and his wife is waiting for him. She's got on a gown just like uh, Rita Hayworth, which is the person he's enamored with. But hello. Anyway, the point is, he hmm. he fell for the substitute instead of for the real thing in the next room. Yep. So this is what that set looks like from there. But I don't think I've ever shown you guys this picture here that kind of shows more of what the lighting of the set looked like. So you can kind of get an idea of how it's all put together. We were teaching a class, and so you know, uh, obviously you see students there in the foreground hmm. and stuff, but. Essentially, yeah. you've got... Speaking of the class, guys, uh, if I may break in before we... Uh, uh... We frozen? Hello. Yep, I got you. Sorry, we didn't hear the last sentence. We can hear you. Well, shall we talk? Well, we can talk. I don't know. Let me text him real quick uh, and see if he can hear us. Aries, can you yeah, hear sorry. us? Yep, we're yes, back. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. we're back now. Sorry, uh, I think uh, my Wi-Fi is kind of starts to dropping a bit. I was just wondering, uh, speaking of the class, uh, do we have any um, workshop coming up this year for people in the United States to attend? or? Not at this time. Yeah. Everything with COVID is so different. I mean, we're going to teach a, uh, a class potentially in October, but it's already been rescheduled okay. once, and we'll see if it gets uh, rescheduled again okay. uh, for the Dallas Photography Guild. Uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me, but if they wanted to come to town and if we were doing it, yeah, it would be a very inexpensive yeah. way to actually come and learn for two days. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, do you guys, uh, so besides those, um, Offline workshops. Do you guys have any um, online? Well, sort yes. Of, I I know we have the adopt me. Yeah, adopt me. Uh, yeah. Um, where so can they, people find you, or do do you guys offer one one on one mentoring stuff? We we, we offer all of that. Uh, however, this you know I don't want this to feel like uh, okay. Well, that was nice of Prachi to ask the question. We don't want to make this a solicitation, so to speak. But yes, uh, you can uh, find us at edmondsonphotography.com. Uh, you can also just look at uh, at Luke Edmondson or at David Edmondson for our Instagram and social media. And uh, we have a Beyond Craft, uh, the art of photography, which is essentially for people that are ready to go beyond just craft and technique and really get to the art side of things. Uh, that's a 15-lesson uh, email series that you could take mm. uh, where there's video lessons in there as well where we talk to you. 
uh, you could also, of course, do one-on-one -on -one mentoring by just reaching out to us. So those are some yeah. of the things that you might consider. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, what's the what's the website? So I can type that into the um, in, sure. so people can make yeah, it easy. Yeah. Beyond photography, right? Or, or beyond craft. Beyond craft, the art Be of photography. I'd have to send you the link real quick. Don't Google it. Yeah. Don't if you can send me the. But if you can send me the link, that'll be great. Yeah, so that uh, people can easily um, get a hold of you. And uh, Charlie's also asking, do you offer personal feedback? Yes, we yeah. do. Yes. In fact, we learn so much, and we love giving people feedback. That uh, we really do, and even very specifically, and even some of the top uh, people who uh, in this industry uh, still need feedback, even though there's sometimes very little pain. That we what you think? We, yep. we all need feedback. Every one of us, absolutely. Yep. All right, Aries, I have just responded to your uh, your question, but essentially uh, the shop Edmonds in photography would give you access to critiques if you want to do critiques, uh, if you want to do the, uh, the email course, those kind of things. So Aries, you tell me in terms of our time, do you want to just show them the video that I uh, sent you in terms of like how we went about uh, creating this particular picture? Or do you think we should answer some more personal questions uh, that may have come in? What would be best for you? I think we are good for now. If there's no further question, maybe let's just call it for the day and um, we can we can show the rest for the, for the next, in the next Facebook talk. That's I think that'll be the, yep. all right, cool. All right, thank you guys for your time. And uh, if there's no further question, let's call it for the day. And uh, I will see you guys until next time. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks.